and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Lord of the Sand Written by Stephen Bacon Performed by Jason Hill Without Facebook, it never would have happened. We'd have all just continued living our lives, content to let the past remain the past. All the bad feelings would have stayed deeply buried. But Facebook allows you to assemble a ribbon of detritus from your life. A place where current friends mingle with barely remembered school chums. Former work colleagues mass like mementos from all the shit jobs you've ever had. I've even got a couple of ex-girlfriends on mine. Just for the sake of old time's sake. What I'm saying he says, I realize that the past is a different country. And it certainly was in our case because we'd fought in it. So when the invitation to attend the reunion arrived, I should have just walked away. I should have let bygones be bygones. I should have looked forward instead of back. My God. How oh, I wish I had done just that. By this time, my army career felt like it had happened to someone else. Don't misunderstand. I'm grateful that I experienced the things I did. Grateful, too, for the training and qualifications I attained. Achievements which, once my decade serving queen and country had ended, became the launch pad into my new career as a telecommunications engineer. But as I'd grown older, my political stance had shifted marginally. Operation Desert Storm had seemed an absolute necessity at the time. However, things had changed. I now felt uneasy about the way the West was dealing with the Middle East. Twenty-five years had made one hell of a difference. Christ, I'm starting to sound like my dad. Anyway, the reunion of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers 3rd Battalion was arranged for December 2nd in the function room of the Golden Plover, four miles outside of Hastings. It had been chosen largely due to its accessibility from London and its close proximity to the home of the organizer, Sean Adams. I hadn't seen Sean, or Beaky as we called him, since Fallujah 1991. But his Facebook photos told me he barely changed other than a receding hairline and a few wrinkles. I was curious to catch up, see what had happened to everyone during the intervening years. I'd initially joined the army with no clear idea of where I was going. Those qualifications that I mentioned earlier, they meant that I was now quite proud of what I'd ended up doing. The group messages suggested there would be quite an attendance of all those invited turned up. I had booked into a travel lodge that lay within walking distance of the pub. At the appointed time, I nervously strolled into the function room, trying my best to look as slim as I had been in the early 90s. The DJ was working overtime and recapturing the era, or oh, Chesney Hawks and Color Me Bad and Jesus Jones, among notable others. I allowed myself to be swept up in a slightly surreal experience of meeting people from my distant past. People I'd once entrusted with my life, but but who now just looked vaguely familiar. The beer bellies and slap hands were in attendance everywhere. Within ten minutes, I had sunk three pints, all the better to steady my nerves. I'd been introduced to several wives, managed to promptly forget their names. Reminded of a dozen hilarious memories, which time had subsequently wiped, and raised somber toasts to a few fallen comrades. Then, shortly before nine o'clock, Beaky made his entrance. 
At this point, I probably need to mention that Beaky had occupied a rather special position in our regiment. He'd been a thin, nervous lad, twitchy, quite unprepared for the horrors that awaited us in Iraq. Unfortunately, he hadn't fared well. There were times when he'd skirted close to cracking. He'd been the butt of many of the pranks that had been played, borne the brunt of the majority of teasing. Not bullying, specifically, you understand, although I had felt a slight nervousness at seeing him again. A twinge of guilt that had manifested over the intervening years. But I needn't have worried. Biggie was welcomed like a returning hero, his slight frame embraced by drunken ex-squaddies and surprised girlfriends. As organizer of the reunion, he was also congratulated as to its success, with slurred pledges to make it an annual event. Very soon he found himself at my table, occupying the empty seat beside me. We made small talk for a bit. I offered to buy him a drink, but he advised me he was driving, something that puzzled me given how close to the plover he lived. Surely he could afford the cost of a taxi. Nevertheless, I returned from the bar with his coke and another pint for myself. I tried discreetly to make light of his experience in the forces, quizzing him enthusiastically about his current life, overcompensating with the positives. Despite his Facebook pictures indicating otherwise, he appeared rather vacant, brittle, broken even. There was a sallow, haunted sheen to his skin. His eyes constantly watched the door, restless and anxious. He admitted that he'd been prescribed powerful drugs for his insomnia. It seemed like he harbored the same debilitating lack of self-worth he'd displayed back then. I felt dreadfully sorry for him. At that point, he excused himself and went to the toilet. Biggie was obviously edgy as all hell, and deep inside I knew why. Brad Augard was conspicuous by his absence. Six foot five, blonde haired Brad had served as our sergeant. He could handle himself, and by God, did he know it. His bloody biceps were so thick it must have used a gallon of ink just to tattoo the Celtic bands that encircled them. I was relieved that he hadn't shown up even if it meant that the central character from our regiment was missing. We all understood that it was Hoggard's mean streak that had fueled the campaign of victimization that Beaky had been forced to endure. He'd mentally bullied the kid as much as inflicting the physical damage on him, and I took no consolation in the fact that Hoggard had been the instigator of the bullying. Every time I'd looked away or pretended not to hear, Another part of my insight had withered. If I'm perfectly honest, I suspect that most of us had just felt relieved that the victim, Beaky, always Beaky, had been someone else instead of one of us. Anyway, about half nine, I was chatting to a bloke who'd been airlifted out of Iraq early into the tour when he swore under his breath and nodded towards the door. I glanced up and felt my heart sink. The disco lights strobed against an imposing figure that was striding into the room. The silhouette was unmistakable. As he crossed the dance floor, I caught sight of Hoggart for the first time in decades. It seemed like nature had played a cruel hand. Unlike the rest of us all, Beer bellies, wrinkles, bald heads, and jowls. Hoggard had apparently taken very good care of himself. His hair was fashionably cut, a tight shirt accentuating his flat stomach and defined muscles. I noticed quite a few wives and girlfriends watching his progress as he strode over to our table. His skin looked like he'd been fucking airbrushed. I stood and tried to spot Beaky at the bar. Several lads cautiously greeted Hoggard and he'd seemed to bask in the attention. 
I headed to the bar to distract Beaky. Maybe even prepare him for the appearance of his nemesis. Someone turned and I heard him mutter. Why the fuck has he been invited? Someone replied, which dickhead invited him anyway? I shrugged, and in that moment I decided to take on the role of peacemaker. But in the end, it was all needless anyway. The evening progressed not at all in the way I had anticipated. Augured actually proved to be whilst not exactly likable, extremely more amiable than he'd been as our sergeant. His career hadn't progressed further than sergeant, however, that may have had more to do with his overt sociopathic tendencies than any lack of ambition. And I was heartened to see that Beaky had let bygones be bygones. At one point, I even saw them laughing together. By the time last orders were called at the bar, the whole place had slipped into a merry state of inebriation. We'd all had a bloody good time. My ears were ringing with the music, and I glanced about, intending to get it a final round of drinks. It was then I spotted Augard, slumped forward across a table nearby. I made some comment about how the big man obviously wasn't able to hold his beer anymore. Biggie laughed, and he went over to see if he was okay. Augard was absolutely paralytic. We attempted to lift him up, his eyes rolling in their sockets. Someone suggested calling an ambulance, but the idea was quickly dismissed. I was just about to volunteer to let him stay in my room at the travel lodge when Biggie piped up, and how he knew Augard's address, and as he'd not been drinking, he would drive him home. That was quickly agreed, and it took three of us to help him out to Beaky's Vectra and see them off, please to stay in touch echoing round the car park. By the time that I returned to the bar, the bell had gone, so I missed the last drink. As a result, I began to sober up slightly. That fact proved to be important later. The crowd had thinned considerably. People were drifting away, swapping phone numbers, drunkenly telling each other how much they'd enjoyed the evening. I felt a satisfied glow at how it had turned out, and then a passing comment tore my cozy world to shreds. I remarked about how unfounded my concerns for Beaky had been, that Hoggard's appearance had failed to spoil the party. I received a puzzled glance. I was told that Beaky had made contact with Hoggard through Facebook, and more or less begged him to attend the reunion. To clear my head, I went out to the car park. I looked thoughtfully at the space that the Vectra had recently vacated, suddenly noticing the overflowing bin nearby, its top filled with discarded cigarette ends. There was an empty packet of tablets stuffed in amongst the rubbish, the prescription sticker torn off. I had to use my iPhone to Google the word Flunitrazepam. Recognizing the name Rofenor, a powerful muscle relaxant commonly prescribed for chronic insomnia, the cogs were clicking in my brain. I ran back inside, babbling at the DJ that I needed to know Beaky's address. His blank face masked the concern he must have felt. I demanded to know the contact details of the bloke that had organized the bloody evening. His reluctance crumbled when I told him I'd found Beaky's house keys in the car park. He looked it up on his notepad, and I wrote it down and called a taxi. I was there in half an hour. There was a light burning in every window of Beaky's house. It was a rather shabby, semi-detached property with thin trees casting a shadow under the bay window. I paid the taxi and fought to compose myself as I crept up the drive. He took ages to come to the door. He looked a bit surprised when he saw me, but then I detected something shift behind his eyes. He held the door open and invited me in. The house was silent. 
It looked like it hadn't been redecorated since John Major had been in power. He led me into the lounge and I sat down on a sagging sofa as its springs wheezed beneath me in protest. Drink? I shook my head. I'd had enough. Besides, I felt rather sick. Where's Hogg? He shrugged. Sleeping like a baby, I imagine. I felt relieved at his relaxed manner. Perhaps I was blowing the situation out of all proportion. He's still got his looks, hasn't he? Beaky took a seat in the armchair opposite me. Looked after himself, he did. I nodded. His house was cramped and cluttered. Bric-a-brac and cheap ornamental tat lined the shelves, entirely covering the surface of a scratched sideboard. Yeah, well, he looked well. How's life been since the army? Uh, Sean. He shrugged. Not too bad, I suppose. He looked up sharply. I endured my time into forces, you know? Despite what happened. Uh, that's... That's good to hear. Do you think about them days much? I shook my head. No, no, it feels like it happened to someone else. The silence that descended then was bloated and dense. To break it, I said, Do you? A thin smile played around his lips, and he said quietly, Oh, I try not to. To change the subject, I glanced around. You got a nice pad here. He raised his eyebrows. Oh, it suits me well enough. I got everything I need here. I don't have many friends. I nodded slowly. Something on a wooden cabinet in the corner caught my eye. What's that there? Oh. Those are my boys. My little boys. I stood and approached. It was a large glass tank. There was a metal lid on top, housing a heater. The interior of the container was dark, deliberately steeped in shadow. A stack of rocks lay half buried in a deep layer of sand. I bent and peered into the far recesses of the tank. What have you got here? Biggie moved behind me. Well, I suppose there are my... Mementos from our time in Iraq. Do you bring anything back with you? Any trinkets? I looked at him sharply, studying his face. I was thinking of what I had hidden in my loft, wrapped in a plastic bag, an automatic handgun, its serial number filed blank. I turned back to the tank. My God, what is it? Lords of Descend. He moved his face close to the glass. They're my two little babies. His voice had taken on a detached, dreamlike quality. I stared into the tank, my eyes picking out the nest of threads that lined the shallow burrows of sand. I could make out the desiccated husks of several large crickets tucked into a niche. Slowly, expectantly, Something scuttled out of the darkness. I could discern the fine hairs that coated the spider's pale legs. Its grotesque mouth anatomy twitched, lending it a monstrous image. Camel spiders, or wind scorpions they're sometimes called, universally feared in the Middle East. Whilst not dangerously toxic, they possess powerful jaws which can inflict great damage on larger mammals. Some of the African lands refer to them as beard cutters, due to their reputation for clipping hair from sleeping men in order to line their burrows. I thought that was a load of old bollocks, but out in Iraq I had once seen one kill and devour a huge lizard. It was brutal. Unforgettable. 
It was said that the bite released an anesthetic toxin, which allowed it to chew away at the prey's numb flesh without detection. Several years ago, I'd watched a documentary on the National Geographic channel, where a camel spider had eaten the leg of a sleeping cat, stripping the flesh down to the bone. They were known as the Lords of the Sand. Christ, mate. Why do you want these fuckers as pets? I was caught halfway between repulsion and fascination. Beaky smiled then, and I noticed his lidded eyes were cast low. Oh, I became obsessed with them out in Fallujah. They just seem to represent something that struck a call with me, I guess. They can actually attack camels, you know. I imported this pair years ago. My eyes searched for the other one, the unseen partner. I was only vaguely aware of what Beaky was telling me. I find him fascinating. How something of this size can be unafraid of taking on something as large as a camel. It's quite admirable, don't you think? The bigger they are, and the harder they fall. Something clicked in my brain. I turned to him. Beaky, where is the other one? I can only see one here. He laughed sharply. His face now looked reptilian and unreal. I felt the hairs on my forearms bristle. Oh, the other one is, um, feeding. I peered closely at the tank. Where? I've kept the other one isolated for a week or so. He turned away, just to get him nice and hungry. In a second, I was pushing past him, moving out of the lounge. The dining room was in darkness, but I could see the light spilling from the stairs. I bounded up them two at once. All good! My voice sounded deafening in the silence. I reached the top of the stairs, feeling disoriented by the doors that faced me. Instinctively, I moved to the left, barging the door with my shoulder. It was the spare bedroom. A lamp illuminated the room from its place in the bedside cabinet. The next few seconds were difficult to comprehend because I experienced everything in an instant. A shape was rising from the bed, sluggish and leaden. As I took in the sight of the figure, I stepped backwards. Vaguely, I recognized Hoggart from his clothing. Although at first, I had the impression that he was wearing a mask. The lower half of his face was a ruined mess. There was a gaping red hole where his nose should have been. Pale strands of gristle protruding through the blood-stained remnants of his nose. His teeth were exposed in a fearsome grin. The skin around his lips was gone, revealing a slender jawbone, and there was very little blood. His eyes blinked mechanically, betraying the fact that he was even alive. How could he be? The lower half of his face had been stripped away, consumed. His legs wobbled, and he stumbled back against the bed. I had a feeling the drug was wearing off. His wrecked face was rendering the cries unintelligible. And then, I spotted the huge spider on the duvet. It looked bloated, satisfied. Its legs trembled horribly. I flicked the material of the duvet and it fell to the floor, trying to scuttle away. My boot stamped quickly, squashing it against the carpet. Pale legs twitched. I swear, I heard a sickening crunch. 
I tried to grab my phone as Hargood rolled around at the bed, shrieking frantically, fingering his destroyed face. He was mad with terror. It was a nightmare scene. And above, the sound of his screams. I could hear Biggie's unhinged laughter coming from downstairs. Chilling Tales for Dark Night.